We're starting a brand new series called Relational Vampires, and uh, I really do believe that this series has the potential to impact us in a, in a big way. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, I, I learned something about my, my family. About my six years ago, I, I would do what I do every night, which I climb up to my daughter's bed before she goes to bed, and I give her a kiss goodnight. And this one night when I went up into her bed to do this, she was doing this. And she would not let, and so I'd go to the other side. I thought maybe she had an injury there, and so I'd go to the other side, and she'd do this. And she was vehemently fighting me off. And I said, honey, what, what's the matter? I'm just trying to give you a kiss goodnight. And she wouldn't tell me. A couple of years later, she, she confessed that she had watched a show that had a vampire and a werewolf in it. And she said for that two-year period, I thought mom was a vampire, and I thought, oh no, I thought mom was, a, yeah, a vampire, and I thought you were a werewolf, and you were trying to bite my neck. So anyway, we're not talking about that kind of vampire in this. We're actually talking about the, the kind of people in our lives that can sometimes suck the life out of us, right? How many of you know that there are certain people that are difficult to love? Anybody in here? Okay, right? Everybody has somebody who's difficult to love. It's just the way that it is. But how many of you also recognize if you're a follower of Christ, we are called, this is our call, is to love God and to love other people. John 13, Jesus tells his followers, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. This is, this is what I'm leaving you. This is what he left his followers. You are supposed to love one another. And you're supposed to do it in the way that I've loved you. That's oh, difficult. I mean, it looks so cool on that screen. It makes us feel so good. But to actually do that, and you think about some of the people in our lives that are difficult to love, that's really hard to do. And so in this series, we'll talk about what, who are the vampires in our lives. They're the critical people who just pick our life apart. We'll talk about that next week. They're the hypocritical people. Anybody? In, uh, don't raise your hand. You have somebody in your life who, who calls themselves a follower of Christ, but their life doesn't really align with the Word of God. So here's the question I'm wondering. What role do we have in that person's life? Do we have any role? And then the, the last week, we'll talk about overly needy people, the people that as much as you give, you give, you give, it's just like a hole that is never filled up and you can never give enough to have, make them happy or satisfy them. Today, let me ask this question, how many of you know somebody who's controlling? Anybody? Don't look to your left or right, don't nudge, <laughs> don't nudge. In fact, if you got somebody going like, you know, that's an indication that we're talking about them, don't tell them no. though. Some of you are listening to this, I realize that some of us have been really hurt by the controlling people in our lives. I mean, it's a real thing. It was an authority figure in your life. And they were just so domineering and, and that, that you're hurt today. Here, here's, I think, the hard part. The hard part is that most of the people that try and control us, they actually don't have bad intentions. They actually have good intentions. They do. They really love us. They mean well, but they're trying to get us to do what they want. They're trying to get us to do what they think we should do. They're trying to push us in a direction. Now, here's the really important part of today's discussion as we look in the scriptures today. The really important part is we oftentimes don't know how to love those people or what to do when we're in those situations. So our default is to allow them to exert their influence on us and to control us, and we do what they want us to do. But whenever you surrender your control to somebody else, you will end up resentful. Not only will you end up resentful, but when you surrender your control to somebody else, you're allowing them to direct your life rather than the God who loves you and I. Whoever controls you controls your future. Whenever we give our control to somebody else, we allow them to direct the direction of our life. Now, in general, there are two types of controllers. And I'm, I'm going to reference this book. It's, it's a book called Boundaries. Uh, these doctors of psychology say two kinds of controllers. One is aggressive. And one is manipulative controller. The aggressive controller basically says, if you don't do what I want, then I'm going to somehow punish you, or you're going to get it, or you're going to be in trouble, or, and there's a threat behind it to do what I want. If you don't do what I want, if you don't do this, there's going to be price to pay for this. Right? It, it, it happens all, all the time in the workplaces. You've got this boss who just terrorizes everybody, and everybody feels like they're just one mistake away from being fired. Because if you don't do what I want, then you're going to be in trouble with me. It, it happens in, in boyfriend-girlfriend relationships all the time. If you don't give me what I want, then I'm not in this relationship anymore. It usually happens in a sexual context. If you don't give me what I want sexually, then I'll go find somebody else who will. 
happens in a marriage all the time, right? If a spouse doesn't get what they want, if you don't give me what I want, if you don't do what I want, then I'm done. I'm done with this relationship. And there's always this feeling of walking on edge and needles. So the aggressive controller's primary methodology, primary weapon is threats. Threats and bullying. Intimidation. Happens with friendships all the time. Man, if you don't do what I want, then you know what? I'm, I'm not talking to you anymore. We're, we're not friends anymore. The other side of that is the manipulative controller. And that's the kind of person that just heaps guilt and always makes us feel like we're indebted to somebody else, right? And so maybe they'll mope around. You, got, you know, we all have friends who maybe mope around when they don't get their way with you. And, you know, man, you really hurt my feelings. And, and, and so they'll make you feel like you owe them and like you should do what they want you to do. Right? Again, it happens in boyfriend, girlfriend. You know, if, 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 you, if you don't do this, then, you know, that, that really hurts my feelings, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And it happens in marriage all the time. It's called the silent treatment. Everybody say silent treatment. Silent treatment, right? If you don't do what I want, then I'm just not going to talk to you. Or I'm going to withhold love and affection with you. It's not aggressive. It's just passive-aggressive manipulative. So there's aggressive and manipulative. And what I want to look at is how do we love somebody who is maybe intentionally or unintentionally trying to exert control in our lives? Because remember, whoever controls you will control your future. So what I want to do this morning is I want to look at an interaction. And look, if you've, if you've never read the Bible, and uh, I'm going to ask one of my friends to help reset the clock up here. If you've never read the Bible before, uh, then it is... Uh, you're, you're missing out. I'm telling you, you're just missing out. You're missing out because it has incredible truth from God himself, but also incredible relational interactions. And Jesus has this encounter with a guy who means well, who loves him, but who's going to try and exert control in Jesus' life. And I want to look at how Jesus loves him. How Jesus loves him. And so in this, we're going to start at this place where uh, Jesus is asking his followers uh, an important question for you and I, if you haven't answered this question, this is the big question. He says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who, who do people say at this point I am? And so they said, well, some people say John the Baptist, and then others say Elijah, and then still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But then Jesus turns the question to them, and he says, what about you? He asked them, who do you now say that I am? After you've seen me, after you've been with me for these many years, and I'm, I'm thinking Peter must have been a, a middle schooler because he says immediately, you're the son of God, you're the Messiah, because that's the, that's the answer to every question. It's Jesus is somehow. But he says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. After seeing you and after being with you, we come to realize this about you. You are the one that we've been waiting for, the one who delivers Israel, the one who rescues us from oppression, the one who delivers us from evil and brings freedom. You are him, but you're also the son of God. You're not just our Lord and Savior, but you are Lord and Savior of the entire earth. Now, could you imagine after he said that, he's waiting for a response. Man, did I get that right? Jesus goes, Peter, that's it. Good job. And I know that flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven did. And Peter is feeling amazing at this point. He just got the biggest, this is the biggest question, by the way. If, if, you, if you're new to church and, or Christianity, you're trying to figure out what it's about, that's the question to ask, is who do we think Jesus really is? And so Peter gets it spot on, and Jesus is celebrating with him. And then Jesus gathers his followers together. Now imagine this. Peter is feeling really good about himself. He just got the biggest answer right. Jesus gathers them together and he, he begins to tell them, I want to let you know what's going to happen. And he begins to let them know what God's will is for Jesus. This is what God wants me to do. We're going to go to Jerusalem. And already they're going, no, 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 let's not go there. They're waiting for you there. No, 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 we're going to go to Jerusalem. And when we go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be taken prisoner. And they're going to treat me really badly. And I'm going to suffer incredible, intensely. And then eventually, they're going to put me to death. But don't worry, because my God, our God, three days later, he's going to raise me from the dead. And he tells them this three times. This is God's will for my life. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer and die. And then I'm going to be raised from the dead. Now, Peter doesn't like this. He doesn't like it. He hates it. 
He can't understand how this could possibly be God's will. And so Peter is going to step in and he's going to take control of the situation. Now here's the really hard part. Peter is not an evil guy. Peter is a friend of Jesus. He loves Jesus. He maybe thinks Jesus is just kind of dark and depressed. He's talking about suffering, death, betrayal. And so he's just maybe a little discouraged. So I'm going to help him. And I, I don't want you to do this. You don't have to do this. I'm going to rescue you. And Peter does oftentimes what people in our lives do. He steps in to take control of the situation. This is what people who kind of control us, they do. And he begins to impose his will on Jesus. And he begins to override God's will for Jesus. That's what controlling people do in our lives. They begin to override God's will and they impose their will on us. And in this moment, that's what he's doing. And in this moment, Peter steps in between Jesus and God's desire for Jesus, what God wants. And he's a blockage to what God wants for his life. And that's what controlling people do, even well-meaning controlling people, is they step into the place between us and God's will for our lives. And whenever we surrender control of our lives to somebody else, we potentially give up the possibility of doing what your heavenly Father wants for you at the expense of doing what somebody else wants for you. And so today we're going to talk about this. How do, we, how do we love these people? How do we actually engage with them in a way that is healthy for them and healthy for us? Now, here's what I, I don't want you to hear. I don't want you to hear, I know some of you are thinking already, I can't wait to get out of here. Nobody's telling me what to do ever again. <laughs> That's it. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, some of you, you need somebody to challenge you, to drive you to a place where you are desperately seeking the will of God for your life. You do. Some of you are in relationships and they, they just need to be challenged. Some of you are, are do, I thank God for the people who have had the courage to step into this awkward place in my life and lead me to truth. Not tell me what they wanted me to do, but lead me to truth and drive me in a challenge in a way that causes me to see God and His desire for my life rather than just my own desire for my life. And the person who challenged me said, hey, you know what? I know you don't feel like you're ready to lead a smaller group of people, a small group, but I think you are, and I just want you to pray about it. And I was like, oh, man, don't put that on me. So I had to go pray and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? God says, I want you to lead a small group. Oh, man. But I thank God for that. I thank God for this, the person who challenged the relationship that I was in because it was immoral, and this girl and I were doing things that we shouldn't have been doing. And somebody came in and said, hey, can I just share with you what the Scripture says? And begin to challenge that. So this is, I'm not saying, nobody's ever going to tell me what to do again. And you use this as an excuse to keep everybody out of your life. That's not what I'm saying. That's actually not what the scriptures are saying. That's not what Jesus is saying. And that's the worst thing that you can do. There's a difference between leadership in our life and people who are trying to control us. Those who are trying to control us are trying to take away from you and I the capacity to make our own decision. Those who are trying to lead us are goading us, are pushing us, are sometimes irritating us to go seek God and His will for our life. Do you see the difference? Okay, so everybody just nod with me if you get it. This is not an excuse, and we don't walk out of here going, that's it? I don't need anybody telling me what I'm going to do. That's my arrogant look right there. All right. So here's the question that we're answering. How do we love the controlling people in our lives? How do we properly love them? What do we need to know? What do we need to do? How, what does this look like? Here's the first thing that we see in this scripture. Jesus was completely confident in who he was and what he was called to do. In order for you to properly love the people who are trying to control you in your life, you need to know who you are and what you are called to do. Jesus was completely clear. This is what he said. He knew who he was and he knew what he was called to do. From that time on, Jesus, he began to explain this to his disciples. He said, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders. Again, this is the first of three times he will say this to them. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, this is what they're going to do. They're going to kill me, and on the third day, I will be raised to life. Jesus knew who he was. He was God's dearly loved son. He was the one who was sent from heaven 
to earth as the Lamb of God to die on a cross to pay the price for our sins. He was completely confident. He knew what he was called to do. He came to seek and save those who were lost, those who were separated from God. He came to pay the price for our sins. He said, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for the unrighteous. I came to lay my life down. I came to go to Jerusalem. And that Lamb that you've been celebrating as a sacrifice for our sins, that's me. And I'm giving my life, not so that everybody will serve me. I'm giving my life to serve humanity. I'm laying down my life as a ransom. That's why I've come. Not to be served, but to serve everybody else. Lay my life down. Pay the price for my sins. So that's why we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die on a cross. But I will be raised again. He knew who he was. And he knew what he was called to do. And look, everybody look up here at me. In order for you to love the people who are trying to control you, you need to know who you are and you need to know what you're called to do. Otherwise, somebody else will define that for you. They will define that for you. Now, when we think of the idea of calling, most of us think about, you know, maybe you read somewhere about a missionary who, you know, they went to, they just left everything, they left their medical practice and they went to Nigeria. Okay, that is a calling. But I think sometimes we make the idea of calling so big and mystical and like specific like that that we we really miss the idea of calling. Or some of you have heard about a a person who they gave up their business and they went and they dug wells in in, you know in in sub-Saharan Africa and that was their mission, that was their calling. That is a calling. But there is another idea of calling that is more relevant to you and I. It's it's not as specific, it's a more general calling. It's a calling to where you're at and it's a calling to the people in your life. So for many of us, if you're a husband like me, your call is to love your wife. Your call is to lead your children. If you're a student, your call is to be a great student and to be an expression of God in in somebody who's studying at a university. Your your call is to get good grades. Your call is to finish your degree, maybe go on to another degree. Your call is to make an impact in that place where God has put you. Your call is to be a witness on your high school, middle school, or college campus. That's what your call is. If you go, well, I'm, not, I'm just a worker. You're not just a worker. Your call is not to a work. Your call is not to a job. Your call is to be a witness in the job. The job that you have is not just so you can get a paycheck. The, God, the job that you have is because God has planted you there with a calling. The call is to be somebody who would share their faith and environment and help other people come into a relationship with God. That's what you're called to do. But if you don't know what you're called to do, then other people can push you in the direction of what they want you to do. I am completely confident of my call. It is very clear to me. Listen to this. Clarity in your calling, clarity in who you are, is powerful. I know my calling is to love this beautiful and amazing woman. For the rest of my life, I will lay my life down to serve her and to love Chris Brennan. That's my calling. That is my primary calling in life. My, my secondary calling, it is to love the children and to lead them into a relationship with God, believing that they can do immeasurably more than I can think or ask or imagine by the power of God that works within them. They will go so much further, go so much farther, because their daddy loved them and led them into a relationship with Christ. That's my calling. My calling is to be the pastor of this church. I didn't choose this. I believe God called me. So my calling is to be the best pastor of this church. It's to use every gift and everything God has put inside of me to shepherd and to grow this church. My calling is to share my faith with everybody that God intersects with my life. I'm very clear on that. That God doesn't just randomly have people cross my life. I want them to know Jesus. So my calling is to share my faith with them. It's to help lead them into a relationship with Christ. Help them follow God and help them become a leader in His kingdom. That's what my calling is. Very clear on that. The importance of this is that there are a lot of things that I want to do, but I cannot do. There are a lot of things that you want me to do, and I cannot do. There are a lot of things that other people want me to do, but I cannot do, because I know what I'm called to do. Does that make sense? I know what I'm called to do, because I know that I'm called to this. That means I can't meet with everybody all the time. I can't. I I would like to, because I love to connect with people, but I cannot. That means I cannot do everything that you want or that somebody else wants me to do. I cannot do that. That means I can't be everywhere. That means I cannot live everybody's life or bail everybody out of their situation. But you know what I can do? I can love that amazing woman right there. You know what else I can do? Because I'm clear on my calling. I can love my children. I can lead them into a relationship with Jesus. You know what else I can do? I can use everything that God has given me to pastor this beautiful church. You know what I can do? I can share my faith every opportunity that I get. I can do that. I can do that clarity in who you are and what God has called you to do is powerful, powerful, powerful. It's powerful. Making sense so far? Here's the challenge for you and I. 
God created us with a little bit of a seed of a desire to please other people. To please other people. That, that's why we have a desire to please Him. It's, it's partly, it's in there. The problem is that many of us, in our desire to please other people, we allow other people's opinions of us to override what God thinks of us. And we live for the opinions and pleasure of other people rather than the opinions and pleasures of God. But this is one of the downsides. If you're totally into social media, I encourage people just to, every once in a while, you've got to take a break from that. Because here's what we begin to think. We begin to think, hey, look at that person. Look at all the attention they're getting. I want that attention, so I want to know, you know, I want to be like them, and I want to do what they're doing. And so we start to value the opinions of other people, and that begins to move us, distract us, and sometimes stand in the way of what God wants for you and I because we so want the, the pleasure of other people. And so pleasing, even though God created us that way, it cre- if we allow it, it can cause us to override God's opinion for us for the pleasure and the opinions of other people. And when we do that, we run the risk of sacrificing our call. Because you know what every controlling person has in common, right? Across the board, every controlling person has this. They have somebody who allows it. That's what they have. We want to make it their problem, but a majority of the problem is the fact that we allow it in our life. But when you have the assurance of who you are and what God has called you to do, then you do not allow the opinions of others override what God thinks and what God desires for your life. So this is so important. The second thing we see in the scripture is we recognize, we have to recognize when somebody's actually trying to control us. We have to recognize it. So Jesus is, is, is so astute. Peter, in verse, six, uh, verse 22, Peter takes him aside and he begins to rebuke him. He begins to correct him. Peter takes him aside. There are things that controlling people do, and there's also something that we fail when we're being controlled. So this is a very common tactic of a controlling person. A controlling person will try and isolate somebody from their family, from their group of people who are speaking truth into their life, even from their friends. And so Peter, and, and the reason why they do that is because controlling people, they lose power in groups. So the way that they maintain power is they pull people aside. And so Peter tries to pull people aside. And then he tries to correct Jesus. And he tries to say, Lord, you're never going to do this. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus recognizes it right away. And so this morning, I, I want to just real quick, two things. There is something that controlling people do. And there's something that we feel. And the thing that they do is they'll, they'll either threaten us, they'll threaten us, to intimidate us, to get us to do what they want us to do. Or oftentimes they'll heap guilt on our lives, make us feel like we're indebted to them to get us to do what they want us to do. In this case, Peter is isolating him to get him to do what he wants him to do. Uh, in other places, it's just a manipulation. It's just a, man, you know, you, you, you owe me. You know, I've been faithful to you. Peter could have said, I just got that answer right. You know, you should at least listen to me a little bit. Peter stop, uh, Jesus stops it right away. So, It's something that they do, but it's also something that we feel. And these are two descriptions of something that we feel. When we feel like we're somebody's trying to exert control in our life, it feels like I'm being pressured to compromise what I value. It feels like I'm being pressured to to, to surrender something that is important to me to please them. It also feels like I am just continually burdened with guilt. If you're a person that has a hard time saying no to a certain person and you always feel like you have to say no and then you feel because you feel guilty, you may want to just check your heart. Why is that happening? Because oftentimes it feels like a continual guilt and I often find it just hard to say no. I just find it hard to say no. We feel pressure to compromise what we value. We also feel it hard to say no. The big problem with this and the reason why we have to, everybody say have to, we have to recognize this is because if you allow somebody else to control you, you could potentially allow somebody to stand between you and God's will for your life. Jesus recognizes it right away. So Jesus does this third thing. He decides when it's right to draw a line in the sand. He draws a line in the sand. He, he basically makes it very clear. This is not ambiguous. This is not, listen, listen to this. This is, this is great. You may want to go home and try this on somebody. I, 
Jesus turned and he said to Peter, and I think he just said, get behind me, Satan. Uh, I just, I'm the one who just said you were the Messiah and the God. Jesus is, is there any question what Jesus means right there? He is so clear. This is him deciding, dude, you just crossed the line. Now you're trying to impose what you want on my life at the expense of what God wants, and I'm not going to have it. And so he just draws a line in the sand. So you may want to go home and try this with your mother-in-law. Just for No, no, don't. Don't do this. With, with your roommate. You got that roommate that keeps wearing your clothes, eating your food. Get behind me. Sit. No, that's not it. This is not a prescription. This is just describing how vehement and how clear Jesus is. There's no question. He is drawing a very solid line. And he says, Peter, in this moment, you are a stumbling block to me, and here's why. You don't have your mind on God's concern, but merely human concerns. Jesus was so clear on who he was and what he was called to do. If he wasn't, he might have allowed Peter's opinion of him to override God's will for him and to not do what God wanted him to do, but he was so clear on who he was and what he was called to do, he recognizes that Peter is trying to manipulate him, trying to control him, and so he draws a firm line and says, nope. This is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. So look, as we're coming to the tail end of this message, let me ask you to think about this. Is it possible? Is it possible? It's possible there's somebody in your life who, who loves you. I mean, they actually have your best intentions in mind. But you care too much about what they think. In fact, you care so much about what they think that you're allowing their opinion of you to override God's opinion of you what God wants for you is it possible is it possible is it possible some of you I know you're going okay like draw a line in the sand what are you talking about and we're used to a certain way of dealing with that I just hope that this thing will pass maybe if I don't cause any problems then it will just go away and I just have to settle for this type of relationship and I want to encourage you instead of settling for that type of relationship I want to encourage you to believe God for something much higher God doesn't want us to live in that little realm. He got something much higher. And here's what we need to recognize. And this may be some difficult truth. Every relationship you have is a combination of what you've created and what you allowed. You are in the relationship you have because of what you've created and what you've allowed. Now think about your marriage. Think about your work situation. And look, we live in a culture, this is really important, where I'm the victim all the time. And this is what's being done to me. No, 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 no. You have a role in this place. You're not there just because it happened. You're there because of what you've intentionally, purposefully created and what you have passively allowed. In your marriage, with your children, in your workplace, with your neighbors. I'm not saying that there will never be any problem. I'm saying, no, no, this is going to be difficulty, but every relationship is a combination of what we've created and what we've allowed. So if you don't like what you've created, if you don't like what you've allowed, then you have to change it. You have to change it. You have to draw a line in the sand. Many years ago, and Chris's parents are not controlling. I'm using them as an example, though. When we first got married, we would go on vacations and go visit them up in the great northwest in Washington, Seattle. And they would stack our vacation time with appointments with aunt so-and-so, with uncle so-and-so, with cousin so-and-so, with third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, cousin so-and-so. You got to see them. And the first couple of years, we came back so tired from our vacations and fighting with each other and we're like this is just crazy you know we realized that the relationship and expectation we had is one that we not only created but we allowed to happen so then I went back to them and I said Satan get behind me no <laughs> I did say it in my head <laughs> I'm a sinner to the we said hey we love you but we expect more out of our vacations, and we don't accept this anymore. And so when we come, we'll see so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but we, we don't want you stacking our time anymore. You know what they said? I said, oh, great. I, we totally understand. We didn't know that bothered you. Yes, it does. No. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Maybe I'm not joking. Here's what we got to do. we got to change the rhythm of the relationship. If you don't like what you have, then you have to create something new. You have to change your expectation, and you have to change what you accept in your life. That's what you have to do. 
this doesn't just make all of our problems go away, but this is what Jesus did. I expect more from you, and I don't accept that behavior anymore, right? So here's what we got to do. We have to have the courage to have a difficult conversation. It doesn't just get better by itself. And we also have to have, to have the courage to put a boundary in place, to put a boundary in place. I just want to recommend a book that I think is so helpful in this. It's called Boundaries. And so as we're going through this series, you may want to pick this book up. Incredibly helpful in understanding what weakness is, why we don't do this, and how to do this in a more appropriate way. So this means, hey, look, I love you. I appreciate you so much. I thank you for the friendship, but I'm not going to let you talk to me that way anymore. That's it. I expect more from our friendship. I expect more from you, and I'm not accepting that kind of harsh, critical behavior and conversation with me anymore. Does that make sense? It means, like, look, I I love you, but I'm not going to bail you out of this again. I'm not. And you can whine, and you can pout, and you can throw a fit, and you can tell me how much I hurt you, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I expect more, and I'm not going to accept this anymore, right? I expect more, I'm not going to accept this anymore. You can tell that to to your, you know, to your kids, we know how to do this with our kids. I mean, it makes so much sense, right? When you, when you have a two-year-old who's thrown a fit in long drugs, and none of you have ever had this because I know you've got perfect kids, but when my kids were two years old throwing a fit in long drugs, and you're trying to bribe them with candies, and then you're trying to threaten them, you know, you're just like trying. No, what do, you, what, do, what do we do? What does a loving parent do? A loving parent says, I love you, but I expect more, and I'm not going to accept this kind of behavior anymore. So you're going to get that candy. Come outside. We're going to get some love, and then we go and get some love. Because, so yeah, I know what you guys are thinking. But because, I ex- everybody say this, I expect more. And I'm not going to accept this kind of behavior anymore. Right? You can threaten me. You can walk out on me. You can do whatever you want. But we're not going to use the divorce word in our family anymore. I'm not going to allow you to speak to me that anymore. Here's what I am going to do. I'm going to love you, love you, love you consistently. I expect more, and I'm not going to accept that. Now, as we get to this, this last part, I, I don't want us to get so focused on, because a lot of us probably got names and faces popping up in our brain, right? The problem is we get so focused on all the controlling people in our lives that we forget that probably the most controlling people in my life is that person that I look in the mirror when I'm brushing my teeth every morning. So let me ask you this question. Could it be you? Could it be you? I'll tell you what, in my life, the most controlling person in my life, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not happy to say that it is me. It is me. It is me. You can, don't, no, you can't. You can't ask my wife. You can't ask my children. You can't ask my staff or my dog. Don't. You know why? Because I always think I know what's best. And I often think that I can fix your problem better than you can fix your problem. And I often believe that if the world just did what I wanted them to do, everything would be okay. And it's not because I'm evil or have bad intentions. It's because, like God, I love you, and I have a wonderful plan for your life. And if you just do it, everybody will be okay. Now, you know why some of you are laughing, right? Because you tried to do that this morning. You tried to do that this morning. And the truth is that any time we find ourselves being that controlling person, we are trying to play God. And you make a cruddy God. And I make a worse God. My perspective is limited. My power is limited. I make a terrible God, but you try and play God. Now look, this is the same thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven. He tried to play God. You try and play God in your life. You try and play God in somebody else's life. Rather than surrendering, hopefully what we come to is the reality that, you know what, I really can't control. I can't, and I shouldn't be the one. And so Jesus tells them this. And I've always wondered why Jesus, and, and you know, in the Gospels, these, this last scripture is connected with this. Here's what Jesus says at the end of all this. After he rebukes Peter, after he says he's not going to do it, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to follow me, you must deny yourself. They must deny themselves. They must take up their cross, and they must follow me. You know what Jesus is saying? If you want to be my disciple... If you want to be my follower, you cannot be God anymore. You can't be God in somebody else's life, and you cannot be God in your life. If you want to be my follower, you've got to do what I'm about to do. I've denied myself so that I can do the will of God. 
and I'm going to lay down my life in obedience to him to do what he wants to say. Because the most important thing in Jesus' life was not his own will. It was the will of God. And Jesus is basically saying, if you want to follow me, the most important thing in your life cannot be you. The most important thing in your life cannot be your will. The most important thing in your life must be the will of the Heavenly Father. This is why Jesus said over and over, we see this pattern. For one of the first things he says is, my will, it's almost like food. My, my food is to do the will of God. That's why I've been sent here. My food, it, it, just, it fills me up. Jesus said at the end of his life, God, I've come to this end and I've glorified you. Having done not what I wanted, but what you wanted. When he taught his followers to pray, he says, teach him that, he says this, this is how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. He didn't say my will be done. He said your will be done. You remember on the last night when he was just about to, to, to be killed, he was in the garden praying, and this was a really difficult thing, and he didn't say, God, look, what I want is really important in this moment. Can you just change the, every?" He didn't say that. He says, God, this is really difficult, but what you want, your will, is more important than my will. If you want to follow Christ, it means denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following Jesus, which is the smartest thing you can do. Who better to put your life your life into the hands of the one who knows best what you were created and capable of doing. And so Jesus says, you know, this is my paraphrase, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to hand over the steering wheel of your life to Jesus. And you don't get to sit in the navigator spot. You don't get to sit right next to him. You get to get in the back seat. Close that partition and, and follow me. We go where I want to go and we surrender because really it's all about his will. Oftentimes we, we really are the most controlling people in our lives. Some of us are feeling that maybe today. But look, the only way that we can fully, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join me this morning. The only way we can fully surrender is to surrender the control that we exert in our lives and in the lives of other people. So what does that look like? That looks like realizing that you can never change your spouse's life. No amount of control, no amount of manipulation can change their heart. But you know who can? Your Heavenly Father can. God can. So we say, God, I'm doing everything that I feel like you called me to do, but I'm entrusting you to do what I cannot do. You only can change your life. You have a friend who's addicted, going through addiction. You do everything that you can do, but at the end of the day, you cannot break the, the power of sin, the power of addiction over their life. But you know who can? Our Heavenly Father can. So we say, God, I've done everything and I'm doing everything that I can. But Lord, I ask you to do what I cannot do. And I'm surrendering. I'm denying myself and I'm denying my desire to control them and I'm surrendering them to you, trusting that your power is able to do what I cannot do because I am not God, but you most certainly are a capable God.